Let's look at lesson 19, Introduction to Quadrilaterals. Now if you remember, a quadrilateral is a polygon with four sides. Uh, quad in itself means four, all right? Quad in itself means four. You have your quadriceps and your legs. It's called your quadriceps because you have four muscles within the the quadriceps. Um, so we want to look at a couple or four different quadrilaterals specifically. Just kind of define them. The first one is a parallelogram. You're going to look at this one a lot. Parallelograms, uh, its <clears throat> uh, property is that both pairs of opposite sides are parallel. Next we have a kite. These are all four-sided polygons or quadrilaterals. Two pairs of consecutive sides are congruent. So you have consecutive sides here, consecutive sides here, and they're congruent to each other. That would be a kite. The next quadrilateral we have is a trapezoid. Trapezoid property is that one, it only has one pair of opposite parallel sides. So these opposite sides are parallel, these are not. And then the last one is a trapezium and that has no parallel sides. And those are all the quadrilaterals. Uh, we're not going to do any math with them right now, we're just simply defining them. The next, uh, but we do want to look at parallelograms a little more in detail because there's three specific types of parallelograms. For parallelograms you have a rectangle and that has four right angles. Uh, it does not necessarily have congruent sides, but it does have four right angles. Rhombus has four congruent sides. And then a square we know has four congruent sides and four congruent angles. Therefore, it is regular. So those are the three different types of parallelograms, and that's really all this lesson is. It's just introduction to quadrilaterals. Uh, we'll just have to use those for later uh, math lessons. Uh, but we do have to know what it means when they say parallelogram or trapezium or trapezoid, different things like that. But anyways, moving on to lesson 20. Lesson 20, also a very short lesson. Uh, this is one of the last logic lessons in geometry. But it, uh, we start by looking at a biconditional statement. Now, a biconditional statement is written in the form of P if and only if Q. In order for this to be true, you would have to make sure that the conditional and the converse statement have to be true. So let's look at an example. Example 1C specifically. It says if x squared is less than or equal to 4, then x is less than or equal to 2. That is your conditional statement. Uh, what we first want to do is write the biconditional statement. So we have to identify P uh, because we need to know P and then Q. So biconditional, we start with P, our, and our hypothesis is x squared, x squared is less than or equal to 4. If and only so we got the middle. So we've done the P, then the if and only if. Now we just write the Q, the conclusion. So our conclusion is right here. Notice then is not within the conclusion. So x squared is less than or equal to 4 if and only if x is less than or equal to 2 would be your biconditional statement. So we got the biconditional statement written down. Now we need to figure out whether it is true and then why or why not? Well, let's look at the conditional statement first. Is this true? Is it true that if x squared is less than 4, then x is less than or equal to 2? Uh, so, for example, let's say 3 was x. 3 squared is 9. Uh, well, that wouldn't work. That's not or sorry, 3 squared is 9, 
but that wouldn't work here because three is greater than the two. Let's look at zero. If we plugged in zero to the x's, if zero is less than or equal to four, okay, we got that, then zero is less than or equal to two. So that one would work out. Um, I'm sorry, I messed up on the three. The three would not have worked because that would not have been less than or equal to four. But the conditional statement does seem to check out. Uh, ignore what I said about the three. Messed up there. But converse, now we have to figure out if the converse is true. The converse would be if x is less than or equal to two, then x squared is less than or equal to four. Now, if the converse ends up working, then it's all true. If it doesn't end up working, then it's not true. And then that would be the explanation. But let's see if the converse is true. If x is less than or equal to 2, then x squared is less than or equal to 4. Okay. So what if we had negative 4 as x? If x was negative 4, that's less than or equal to 2. That works. But if we plug it in here, negative 4 squared, that would actually be 16. That would not be less than or equal to 4. So therefore, the converse does not work. So it is false. Uh, converse is proven. I'm not going to write the whole thing up, but converse is proven wrong because the counterexample of negative 4. So use your counterexample, but that would be how you would do one of those problems. You would write the biconditional and determine whether it's true, and you determine whether it's true by knowing that the conditional and converse both must be true. One other thing, I'm not really going to spend any time on this, but just so you know this, I think, I think you actually learned this in your English class, but compound statements, uh, those are just statements that uh, are combined using the words and or or. Those are compound statements. That's all it is. And I'm not even going to do any problems with this. But a conjunction specifically uses and. And then a disjunction uses the word or. So when we're, right, when we're combining statements uh, such as, let me look at one. If we're combining statements such as a customer orders a filet mignon and a customer receives a baby salad the baby spinach salad appetizer, interesting statement. You could combine those with and, and that would make it a conjunction, or the word or making it a disjunction. And that is compound statements. We're not going to really spend any time on that. That's not going to be uh, used too much uh, in further detail in geometry. But that is the end of lesson 20.